Good morning and welcome to the Flexible Space Association's Workspace Wisdom webinar. I'm Jane Sartin, the Executive Director of the Flexible Space Association. And we've been asking our members what topics they'd like to see covered in these webinars. And a topic that has been suggested more than once was cybersecurity. So really pleased that today we've got Simon Newman, who's the CEO of the Cyber Resilience Centre for London, joining us to cover this topic, um, which I think is going to be a really helpful one for, um, for everybody within the industry. And I think just in, in general, probably in our own lives as well as work ones. Um, so as we, I'm going to hand over in a minute to Simon, but as we go through, um, do add put any questions into the chat box but we'll pick those up at the end and there'll also be time for, for questions at, at the end of, of Simon's presentation. So I will pull up his presentation and there we go. Over to you Simon. Okay well good morning everyone and thank you very much Jane. Hopefully you can all hear me uh, clearly this morning. Uh, I should just apologise first of all I've got a bit of a cold so uh, I'm, I'm sounding a little bunged up but uh, hopefully not too bad. Um, so thank you very much for giving the opportunity to speak to you uh, about uh, a really important subject that uh, we've been working on for a number of years now. It's considered as a major threat to the UK economy and that of course is cybercrime and the impact it particularly has on businesses uh, across uh, across the UK. So the presentation this morning just very briefly a little bit about us, uh, what we do and, and how we operate, uh, some of the things that we're seeing in terms of the current threats and then what simple things that you can do to reduce uh, your vulnerability to common cyber threats. Uh, and I'll start off by just a message of reassurance that our view is that in fact, the majority of cybercrime can easily be prevented by taking some very, very simple steps. So uh, let's start off by introducing us. So Cyber Resilience Centre for London, we're part of a national network of centres across England and Wales. There's nine, in fact. Um, we are uh, a key part of the government's new national cyber strategy. We're government backed and funded. And uh, we work in collaboration with uh, law enforcement, um, industry and academia with the purpose, as we mentioned there, to help SMEs in particular and third sector organisations uh, reduce um, their vulnerability. Um, in London, we launched uh, back in October uh, last year. So this is uh, month sixth for us. We're still very much in our, our, our early days. Uh, and uh, we've been um, uh, sort of set up as a collaboration between Metropolitan Police, City of London Police, British Transport Police, and the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. So that gives you an idea of, of how we operate. Um, in addition to all of the centres, so if you're located outside of London, uh, please visit your own or your local cyber resilience centre. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about what we do in a moment. Um, we also have a national centre and that provides support to each of the centres uh, and also looks after what we call some national ambassadors. So organisations like Microsoft, KPMG, uh, NatWest, for example, they all support the centres uh, and help us um, uh, reach as, far, as many of those SMEs uh, as possible. Uh, so, as I mentioned about the sort of model that we operate here, each of the centres, so whether you're in Newcastle or Plymouth or London, pretty much get the same service and consistency is really important. And there are four key things that we, we do. So the first is we have a community uh, and that's really about signing up to a, to a monthly newsletter uh, where you get a range of uh, free resources, both from ourselves and the National Cyber Security Centre, you know, the government's technical authority for all things cyber. Uh, we also are gonna start introducing and being able to share some intelligence that we're getting from government and policing around cyber threats as well, uh, and a range of sort of other resources to help you improve your cyber security posture. We have something called CyberPath, and I'll come on to that a little bit later on, uh, but that's where we take university undergraduates studying computer science related courses, we train them and then we deploy them to deliver some very low level basic cybersecurity consultancy work. The idea is that it gives them some experience and hopefully they then go and join the cybersecurity industry to address the huge skills gap that we've got in the country. We also have a range of partners we work with who are able to provide cyber essentials. Um, and again, we'll come on to that in a little bit later as the government's minimum standard for uh, cyber. And then finally, something we're, we're really focused on in London is something called community outreach. So as well as uh, providing that sort of newsletter uh, and, a, and a website where we've got that information and resources, we actually go out and we visit businesses face to face. And we go out with uniformed police officers. So my team are in uh, Bromley today. And one of the things that they do is they talk to those really hard to reach organisations about cyber risk. We set ourselves a target this year of, of meeting 1000 businesses uh, face to face. Uh, this morning at about half past 10, we actually hit the thousandth already. So we're on target now to hit over 3000 this year. So we're really pleased with that. We get some really information, interesting data uh, and information coming back from those visits about the level of cyber risk that's out there. 
So before we start, just wanted to talk about the types of cyber criminals that we see in the UK, probably very similar to other parts of the world as well, and generally recognised about five different types. So first of all, we and we've got some examples as well coming up in a moment of how these criminals operate. The first one we have are what we call uh, the social engineers. So these are people who use psychology as a way of trying to get information out of you, whether that's passwords, yeah, credentials, login details and so on. Uh, and again, we've got some examples of how they work. Um, we've got spearfishers. Those are people who go after specific individuals within organisations. Sometimes that may be a senior leader, perhaps a chief executive, member of the board, or also, it could be someone who has decision making authority, typically someone perhaps who works in a finance department who has the ability to be able to pay invoices. So spear phishing. And again, we've got examples of how that works. Then we've got hackers. Now, hackers range uh, from um, kids who are uh, interested in cyber. We've seen cyber criminals or hackers uh, as young as 10 years old in some cases even younger, um, who perhaps watch videos on YouTube or other social media channels uh, and are able to pick up some fairly good skills and then hack into some quite sophisticated systems. At the other end of the scale, we're seeing organized criminals uh, increasingly using hacking as well as state sponsor attacks um, such as places for, uh, as, uh, as Russia, North Korea, Iran. Now, you may say as a small organization, uh, why would you be attractive to some of those uh, uh, big organized criminals or to, uh, to st nation state attackers? The simple answer is you're probably not targeted specifically. It may be because you're part of a supply chain. So you end up being caught up as part of some of those broader attacks. And again, we'll look at that a little bit later on as we discuss the issue around supply chain. Then we've got something called the rogue employee. And this is a really big area that we're quite concerned about at the moment. Now, rogue employees, it may be that you've got um, what we call the insider threat. So it could be a malicious member of staff who is uh, deliberately sharing um, confidential uh, secret information uh, to the outside world, or it could be through carelessness, people leaving um, USB sticks or login details in public display. Using the laptop, logging in on a public uh, uh, transport, for example, is another, another way. And all it takes is someone to get those details, and potentially they've got access then to your sensitive data. And then finally, we've got those who are involved in ransomware. Now, ransomware, in simple terms, is where an organization has their data encrypted by an attacker, and in order to recover that data, are expected to pay some form of a ransom. Um, now, data we've seen at the moment shows that only a very, very few number of organizations actually are able to recover all of their data if they pay a ransom. So uh, interesting area at the moment, lots of discussions about whether to ban paying ransoms as part of uh, new legislation, uh, but certainly one that's been on the rise over the, over the last couple of years. Now, I just wanted to share this with you first of all, because I thought this just gives a really good indication of what we're seeing in London specifically. So we asked an insurance uh, company of, uh, who we work with very closely uh, to provide a, a map of the threats against businesses purely in London. So they set up what they call a honeypot trap. So this is where they're able to capture the threats coming into London businesses. And you can see this goes back to the end of April. We had 91 million attacks against businesses in London uh, just over a 28 day period. Those 91 million attacks came from 138 different countries, 14,000 cities. So London businesses are being targeted from a range of different places. And you can see the biggest dot there right in the middle is Russia, which is perhaps where you'd expect to see some of those attacks. And on the right hand side, you can see the types of attacks that we're seeing. And so we're able to provide guidance and support to businesses on how to prevent those things having an impact. But that gives an indication of the scale of the threat that we're seeing here in the UK and specifically in London. And then I just wanted to also highlight this. So this is a, a survey that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, produced by government called the Cyber Breaches Survey. It's a really fascinating read. And there's some really great examples in there of some of the concerning statistics that we're now seeing around the level of cyber crime affecting businesses. Now it's focused purely on businesses and charities. Uh, and there's a few things there which I just wanted to highlight. So first of all, 32% of businesses have suffered at least one cyber attack or a breach in the past 12 months. Now that's actually gone down from last year where the estimate was around about 39%. And on the face of it, that looks fantastic news. But what the report says is that businesses are probably less able now to spot the, whether they've been a victim or not. So that's a really worrying trend. And it goes on to talk about the lack of basic hygiene tools that these companies have. If you're a larger organization, you can see there that the chances of being a victim are even higher. So a large organization, 69% have suffered at least one attack or a breach in the past 12 months. One of the other interesting statistics I wanted to draw your attention to there was around training. 
So one in five businesses, only one in five, provide any form of training for their staff on common cyber threats. But again, it's one of the simplest, the easiest thing that people can do, and yet very, very few organizations do it out there. So if we're not able to spot these types of things coming through, then again, it makes it easier for criminals to access our data uh, and the secure information that we hold. Interesting statistics there about reporting, um, encouraging that 38% of businesses, if they've suffered a breach or an attack, do actually report it externally. Most of those reports go to managed service providers or IT companies who are there to support them. In policing terms, we probably get somewhere in the region between three or five percent uh, of crime reported to us. So the less we know about it, the less resources get put into it, the less resources get put into it, the bigger the problem becomes. So one of the things we're really passionate about is to make sure people do report it appropriately to the relevant authority so we get a better understanding of the nature of cybercrime that's out there. And then there's a few statistics at the bottom that I think are quite interesting as well. So again, there's been a drop in the number of organisations who have a board member with specific responsibility for cybersecurity. So it's fallen down as a priority. And as you can see on that next statistic, so two thirds of, of businesses uh, see cybersecurity as a priority. That's dropped quite significantly from last year. Now, clearly at the moment, we have a cost of living crisis. We're just recovering from the pandemic. There's a whole host of other issues. And understandably, most businesses are focused on survival. But the fact that cybersecurity is dropping, again, just creates uh, an opportunity for criminals to exploit that uh, and potentially cause some challenging uh, uh, things for those businesses. And then I'll talk about phishing in a moment, but that still uh, is the number one most uh, common and also the most disruptive type of attack that we're seeing uh, being used by cyber criminals. Um, so phishing has been number one for a number of years and undoubtedly it will continue to be so. Why? It's very easy to do. It's also very easy to do at significant scale and it's surprisingly successful. And they're right at the bottom there in terms of the number of cyber crimes. So this is an estimate of what we think that's out there. If we had all of the crimes in, in the country together uh, and we put them all in one pot, we estimate there's around about 10 million uh, crimes uh, as a ballpark figure. If you put cyber crime and fraud together, that amounts to about six and a half million offences. So we are seeing cyber crime and fraud now well over 50 percent of total crime. And again, that figure continues to grow. So that just gives an indication of what we're seeing uh, from a national perspective. And then just to look at the cyber breaches survey where they talk about the most common types of attack. Here are the top five. So we mentioned about phishing. We've got impersonation, BEC, which is what we call business email compromise. We've got an example of that in a moment. Viruses, where they're using uh, malicious software to attack people. Password vulnerability, and I've got a slide on that in terms of some of the challenges we're seeing around password. And then supply chain resilience, which is one that's been popping up recently and will be clearly a major uh, issue for um, many of the members of the association here. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the things that you can do there to hopefully reduce your vulnerability in that regard. So that's just an indication of the common types of things that we're seeing. Now, types of phishing, these are the top five that we're seeing. Some of these you will be um, incredibly familiar with. Uh, and again, we've got some examples of those. There's a new one that's come on the block recently, which is that number five there, angler phishing. And this is really quite interesting. Uh, and again, I've got an example to show how that's being used, but something really to be mindful of um, as organizations potentially can fall vulnerable to that type of attack. The types of phishing that we see, typically email is a very, very successful way of targeting organizations. Uh, and it's not necessarily organizations. We would have seen these in our own personal accounts as well. And many of the things that we talk about at the Cyber Resilience Center for London is exactly the same that you would expect as an individual, if you're a charity, if you're a small, medium sized business as well. The same kind of principles apply uh, and the simple things that you can do are, are also uh, applicable as well. So we know that cyber criminals are very good at imitating and mimicking organizations. Most of us probably have some form of, a, of an account with a, an organization like Amazon, perhaps Netflix, for example. Uh, and so the, the criminals will mimic these organizations and try and encourage us to click on a link which then perhaps takes us through to a page where we'll be asked to provide uh, some uh, some personal information that the criminal can then use either to commit additional fraud or possibly even go and sell those details on to other criminals uh, as well. Uh, and this is typical of the type of crime that we see happening on a very regular basis. And there are a few things there just as little red flags to, to spot if you're not familiar with these types of, of attack. So first of all, on the top left, you can see the email address, although it does look legitimate on the top left hand side. If you scroll over that email address, you can see that actually it doesn't look anything like an official Amazon account. So again, that's a really big red flag to say that it perhaps it hasn't been sent by Amazon themselves. 
Again, there's a request for information. So updating payment information or visit a link. Uh, and again, if you hover over those things there, it should give you the real page, which would show that it's not a legitimate site as well. On the right hand side, this is quite a clever one. It's kind of an evolution of where phishing has evolved. So this is about things like refunds. So again, it's been written with the concept of trying to get people to, to respond. Uh, and as soon as we see the word refund as human nature, uh, we think fantastic, maybe we're due some money back. So it's trying to encourage people to click on links. And again, there we talk about people not passing uh, financial details and so on. All it's asking for there is to update your, your details. Uh, so people think, well, that looks legitimate. And off we go, we click on it. And potentially those are the problems that can come from it. So that's still a very common one. Uh, we see, uh, um, as I said, other companies um, uh, um, sort of being mimicked. We saw certainly during the pandemic, uh, the likes of the Royal Mail, HMRC, as government announced sort of support packages. Um, so it's a question and one of the reasons why training is so good. It's a really good way of spotting those current threats and how to deal with them. Um, I thought I'd use this as a really good example of spear phishing. So this is off, this is focusing on a specific individual within an organization. And this is how the criminals here do their homework to find out who to target. And they've got ha their hands on some information here, which is all open source. And they've used that to try and convince someone to, um, to send some money to, uh, to a malicious account. Now, on the right hand side, just a brief description, as you can see here, um, they've decided to target exhibitors at a conference called RegTech. We've probably all been to conferences uh, in the last uh, few months. I was at two or three last week, um, and it was great to sort of share this example as well. Now, they've identified the criminals here, an individual called Laura, and she works for a company called Startup, and she's actually due to speak at the conference, and she's quite senior within the organization. Now, Laura here put a post on LinkedIn to say how much she was looking forward to the event, and that she was hoping to catch up with some of the suppliers of her company. So the criminals then had a look at the website of the organization. They also looked at the social media posts and noticed they'd recently announced a deal with a supplier called NNU. Fantastic, they thought. They also then looked at the website and LinkedIn profiles to identify people within the organization potentially they could target. And they find a chap called Andrew and Andrew works in the accounts department. So here's an individual with the authority to be able to process payments uh, to accounts. So then the criminal decides to impersonate Laura, armed with that information and trying to encourage uh, Andrew there to pay that money into a fraudulent account. So again, if Andrew's looking at this, first up, he's looking at this and reading it as if it's personal to him. There's enough information in there to convince him potentially that this is actually Laura because he's spoken to Laura uh, and he knows that she's going to that conference. And arguably, this is the type of, of, of very cleverly worked email attack where the criminal's done a research uh, and potentially can go through and, 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 and commit a fraudulent act. Um, we had one a few weeks ago. We saw someone uh, pay fake invoices of up to £30,000, and it can be done literally with a few minutes. So a very effective way of working. And criminals are constantly looking how they can gather that information that's out there in the public domain to, to target individuals. Another one we've got, and, a, and, a, and I'll give a very brief example, we'll all receive invoices uh, from, from companies. Um, sometimes uh, cyber criminals are very good at hiding malicious code into those attachments, particularly PDFs. So once that we open those, uh, potentially we then fall uh, victim to them and that allows criminals uh, to access our systems and obtain other data. Uh, and very briefly, I just wanted to talk about this case study, which is a really good example of how that works in practice. So we go back a few years, We've got a private school in the south of, of, uh, of England uh, and they had a, a new admissions process. So uh, parents or families of children going into the school were invited to send in um, a completed admission form and send it into the admissions email inbox. Now, the criminals decided to, to, to target the school and they inserted a piece of, piece of malicious code into um, an attachment, sent it into admissions. And as soon as the admin person there opened up, that particular file, it gave the criminals access to the systems. Now, the criminals, once they were in, were very clever. What they wanted to do is they wanted to understand who uh, was potentially new to the school, perhaps unfamiliar with the processes, and they found a folder marked uh, new families or new, new children. Once they were in there, they took out the details, uh, the email addresses of all the people that were submitting applications for their children, and then they emailed them on behalf of the school to say, great news, little Johnny's got a place, we're delighted to offer you a discount if you pay early, if you pay it into this bank account. So of course, uh, uh, parents thought fantastic, it's very expensive sending children to, to private school, uh, 150,000 pounds went out straight away to that fraudulent bank account. The school was completely unaware 
that the criminals were in the system at this stage. And it was only picked up when there was a summer fate and the bursa who told me the story originally says that it was a parent who spoke to him and said, fantastic, great news about that discount. Uh, only to suddenly realise that they'd been compromised. Now, at that point, uh, the bursa decided to react and said, OK, I need to send an email out to all of the families to say that we have been compromised. And in that email, he said, do not pay this bank account. It's fraudulent. These are our bank account details. Now, the criminals were still in the system. So before that email went out, the criminals were able to swap the bank account details over and another £100,000 went out. So a quarter of a million pounds was lost to a very simple but very cleverly worked out fraud. And the bursa who tells the story says it was one of the hardest periods of his life. The amount of stress that he had to deal with, parents who'd lost large sums of money, dealing with insurers, the police, the banks, etc. Not to mention the reputational harm as well that was done to the school. So that's just a really good example of how easy it can be for criminals to operate. Now, I mentioned angler fishing, and I thought I'd just use this as an example. So watch for this, where you're being mimicked by your, your organization, uh, by, by cyber criminals. In the example, we've got Argos there. So what they're doing is they're hovering over the official accounts. When someone has a go uh, at, uh, at that organization, they're very quickly in and saying, look, please send us your details, direct messages, uh, and we can hopefully address it. Now, surely once they've got that, they will then start asking for more information and potentially they will have access. So in the Verizon, Verizon case there, may be able to order new phones or, or other devices uh, and, uh, and commit other fraud. So very uh, uh, sort of new area that we're seeing at the moment in terms of phishing. And again, just an example of how criminals are evolving. Just a quick reminder on how to report. Um, so hopefully you should be aware of these. The government have set up a phishing uh, email address there, report at phishing.gov.uk. They're very, very good at taking down websites. Uh, so that's really good. There's also a, a, a an SMS or so text messaging uh, where you say, so if you get a, a fake text message, you can forward it to 7726 as well. And if you see a fake website, particularly if it's mimicking your organization, again, the NCSC have a page on their website showing you how that can get taken down. And of course, action fraud, which is going through rebrand at the moment and there'll be new and new action fraud process introduced in the very near future we'll share the presentation so you can have those details as well now i did mention at the beginning about most cyber crime can be prevented by doing some really easy and simple things and most of those things don't cost a penny and i'm going to talk to you about some of those things that you can do so passwords we identify that as one of our key areas of risk uh, interesting, as Microsoft say there, as we started using passwords, uh, what, 15, 20 years ago, we maybe only had a handful of passwords. These days, it's not uncommon for us to have passwords, uh, sort of 30, 40, maybe even more. Um, if we think about the systems we use at home, at work, pretty much all of those uh, require some form of a password. As a result of that, we end up using either the same password for multiple accounts or we pick passwords that are very easy to guess. And as it says there, it's quite easy in many cases for criminals to guess your passwords because we are humans. We like to keep things as simple as possible. The other thing to bear in mind, that bottom bullet point there and a word of warning, how secure do you make sure that your staff are in relation to their passwords? Have you got a password policy in place? Um, so, again, we can provide support and advice on what to do there. And this effectively is advice that government now gives. So we suggest using three random words as a really strong way of being able to, uh, to, to use a password. So if you look there at the bottom, we've got London Beach Music, three completely random words. And if we look at that, that's a mixture of well, that's 16 characters or 16 letters. And that would take roughly somewhere in the region of a criminal to, uh, to break or to break uh, about two billion years, which is an awful lot of time. There's nothing out there that's gonna be completely uh, secure. But the purpose here, what we're trying to do is make ourselves less attractive to the cyber criminal and certainly less attractive than perhaps your next door neighbor. So just by implementing simple password controls like that can make a world of difference. One of the things that I like to talk about as well is in terms of how you check your credentials. So this is a website that's been developed by a director of Microsoft called Have I Been Pawned? All you need to do is put your email address in there and it tells you whether your data has ever been compromised. Um, now, in the event that if you do find a positive return uh, on this, go back to the website or the account that you've got, change your password uh, and make sure that uh, you've updated it in a secure way. Um, if criminals do have access to it, then potentially they do get access to quite a lot of information. And here's an example of something that I use. This is a previous email address that I no longer use. Paddy Power, like a little flutter on the Grand National every year. And you can see here, 2010, they were breached but the breach itself wasn't disclosed until 2014. So the amount of information those criminals had in that four years, I was completely unaware of. 
And if you read what you've got there in terms of that detail, so account balances, dates of birth, email addresses, physical addresses, security questions, unit usernames, huge amount of information which becomes very, very valuable to cyber criminals. So constantly have a look at that, review that periodically, and just make sure if you do find a breach, update your details. Other websites that you visit as well, I mean, Google is very good these days. If you've got an account with Google to alert you if your data has been compromised through another breach as well. Other things you can do, um, password managers, we also suggest very strongly about using those. So the idea is you have one master password uh, and then that stores all your other passwords very securely. So much easier to remember. Um, two factor verification is something we, we insist upon and we've been working with businesses to set that up automatically. Uh, you'll find some of the accounts that you work with now you're required to do this. So it simply means that as well as putting in a password, you are also required to put in uh, an additional form of identity as well. So that might be a text message that you get. It could be using uh, biometrics such as a fingerprint or so on. Again, so if the criminal gets hold of the password, it's much harder for them to break because they still require an additional piece of information. Most criminals are opportunists. They simply, if they can't get in the first time, there are plenty of other people out there who will make it very easy for them. So always switch on two-factor verification. And so certainly those of you who are working in the IT field, strongly encourage to make sure that all of your devices uh, have that capability built in. Mentioned supply chain very briefly. We've got a few minutes left. I just wanted to talk about this. This is something government are really concerned about at the moment. Um, we're seeing a huge rise in supply chain. And in fact, very few organizations actually review the, the risks around their supply chain. You can see there uh, from the cyber breaches survey, just around 13%. So one thing to think about yourselves is, do you actually review it? How frequently do you review it? For those second tier suppliers, it's even lower than that, it's about six to 7%. Now, why is supply chain threat grown so quickly? Well, there's two reasons. Number one is that larger organizations uh, have improved their cyber security so much over the last few years, it's made it a lot more difficult for cyber criminals to be successful. So what they do is they go for weaker access points. And typically that's the supply chain. The second reason is that supply chains are incredibly complex. They're lengthy, they're international. And the cyber criminals have worked out that if you do manage to get into a supplier, not only are you just going to affect that organization, but chances are they will supply dozens, hundreds, if not thousands of other organizations. And so the impact of that breach can be felt right across the world. So supply chain vulnerability is a big one. The National Cyber Security Centre have recently issued new guidance on supply chain and something we're working with them very closely to look at how we can educate uh, businesses to just review the risks on a regular basis. And if you're a larger organisation, work in partnership with your smaller suppliers to just try and reduce that vulnerability. 10 things that we suggest, uh, and I'll leave these up there. Um, there's one thing I would suggest here, which is really important. Well, two things I wanna focus on. Number one, people who leave your organization, how long does it take you to lock down their accounts so they no longer have access? I am staggered at how long it takes some organizations to do this. Uh, when I was speaking to about two weeks ago, six months after someone had left, those people still have access to accounts and they've gone to work for a rival. So we make it easier for people to cause us grief. And the other issue as well there, which I think is important, is around the using, using or disposing of old technology. So once that equipment has ended its life, what do we do? Well, sometimes we give it to friends, to family, maybe we give it to charities. Have we correctly disposed of, of, that, of the, the data that's on there properly? Uh, have we wiped it clean? Lots and lots of cases where people have bought um, devices uh, through charities and so on, uh, and uh, suddenly discovered they've got access to some incredibly sensitive data. So make sure you've got a policy in place about how you actually ensure your devices are clean before you dispose of them. And then of course, cyber essentials, which I just wanted to sort of briefly uh, mention in a moment. One thing I will say, if you're a business based in London, I talked about CyberPath uh, that we're offering uh, across the country. We've actually got some additional funding for the mayor's office. So we are delivering free of charge 200 first step web assessments. That's a vulnerability in your website. We do two hour security awareness training sessions. There are two going on this morning, which I'm delighted about. And we also do policy reviews as well. So if you're SME based in London and you would like that, please contact me. Delighted to be able to give that to you free of charge. And also we've got discounts off cyber essentials. In fact, what we'll do for members of the association is we'll double that. So if you would like to take cyber essentials and you haven't got it, we'll give you a hundred pound discount as opposed to a 50 pound discount. Uh, and you can see on the right hand side, the other services we're providing through students. But those ones are funded by the mayor's office for this um, particular year. 
And then just to finish off talking about cyber essentials, uh, this is the government's flagship scheme. It's the minimum standard recognized for businesses. We're seeing now discussions in government about mandating it as part of the new procurement bill that's going through Parliament. The idea is that it will be a minimum standard that every organization has to have in place. If you're a small business, it's £300, it's a self-assessment, uh, or if you're a larger organisation, the costs go up uh, um, to, to £500. Um, you'll find if you do business with government that it's almost now uh, insisted upon as, as having as a prerequisite before um, submitting tender documents. And again, we've got partners who can support you going through that process. So again, if anyone's interested, please contact me and we'd be delighted to give you a discount on that uh, accreditation as well to, uh, to ensure we get as many organisations accredited to cyber essentials as possible. I think I'm just coming up to my uh, my end of my time here. Those are my details. Please give us a follow on social media. Visit our website, which we're just about to revise. Contact me directly. More than happy to help you and support you in cyber. And if you'd like to join our community, sign up for our free newsletter. Click on the QR code and sign up there. It's completely free and we're not going to charge anything at all for what we do um, because we are there ultimately to support businesses and charities become more cyber secure. Thank you, Jane. Over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. That was an awful lot of really helpful information packed in. I, I suspect some of it's a bit alarming to some people, but being informed is has got to be what's important. And if you're informed, then you can, you can much better manage the situation. Um, so thank you for that. Um, just a reminder, any, we've got a few minutes if anyone's got any, any further questions. Um, maybe just to to, to pick up on a couple of things. So you covered us, you covered an awful lot there. If there was only one thing to improve a company's cyber resilience, what would you recommend that to be, at least for the priority, the thing to do first? Yeah, th thank you, Jane. I think training and awareness is probably the most important thing. So helping staff understand uh, what the common cyber threats are and how to deal with them. Um, one of the biggest risks we see is that, an example for phishing, is the longer it takes someone to report uh, a phishing incident to their IT manager or their IT department, um, potentially the bigger the damage can be done to your organization. So awareness and training is so, so important. My view is staff are the first line and most important line of defense. So that's absolutely critical for me. Regular awareness and training uh, is, is the number one. Thank you. And a question that's just, just come in. If we get phishing emails, can we just forward them to the email address that you provided? That's it. Yeah, that's all you've got to do. Um, and the government will then uh, review it and take it down. And they act very, very quickly. If any of you are using Office 365 as well, there's a little add on that you can have on the top right hand side of your screen. So if you do get a phishing email that comes in, all you've got to do is press phishing and it will take it off there as well. So um, there's a couple of things and your IT providers may be able to support you on that as well. But please do report it. The government are incredibly quick at taking those things down. The more we know about it, um, the, the better they're able to act. It's a bit like whack-a-mole though, because once the criminals have one route closed down, they'll go and start something else up, up there. But what we want to try and do is make the UK as hostile as possible to cyber criminals in the hope they go and bother another country. So this is one of the ways that we can do that. And, I, and I've realized from experience, fortunately, not to the point of actually handing over m any money or anything, that it can be a lot harder to spot suspicious emails on a phone than on if you're looking at it on a desktop, because if you're I, certainly on, on an iPhone, it doesn't display the whole email address. You're just seeing a name. It can be a name of someone you know, and then you read it thinking that. So it's, yeah, it's probably worth checking on, on, the, on, the, on a PC if you're suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the key point, isn't it, Jane? You know, human nature, you know, be suspicious, be cautious. If you're, if you're not expecting an email or a text message from someone. Uh, so, for example, the other day, actually, over the weekend on Facebook, my I had a, a friend request from my stepmother. Now, it looked completely legitimate. Uh, the picture was the same as my stepmother used. And I thought that's interesting. But, you know, human nature in me is, is I, you know, I was cautious. So the first thing I did was picked up my stepmother and said, have you been hacked or have you been compromised? Oh, let me check. Yes, looks like it. So straight away, we were able to, uh, to, to, to deal with that. But just be cautious. Human nature is that we should be quite cautious in how we operate. Okay. And another question that's just, just come through. Um, do you still recommend three random words plus numbers and symbols as good practice? Uh -huh. Well, yeah. I mean, three random words, I'd say, is the minimum is what you should be doing. If you want to add numbers, symbols uh, on top of that, fantastic. It makes it incredibly secure. And as you saw from that previous slide, you know, you're talking quadrillion years before a cyber criminal is able to break it. Um, you know, in that case, if you are going to use that, I would certainly recommend using a password manager um, because it's going to be much more difficult to remember 
uh, a longer, more complicated password. But yeah, that that is a you know the Rolls Royce of uh, of security is three random words, symbols, letters. But for most people, three random words is more than enough. And you mentioned ransomware in your presentation. Should in your view, should anyone ever be paying the ransom to recover data? Yeah, this is this is a controversial question, uh, Jane. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's a tricky one. I mean, my view on this, uh, ransomware is really hard to deal with. Um, there's two things I would say. The first thing is I, I think it's right. It's a business decision. So ultimately, it's not for government to, to direct or police whether you should or should not pay uh, ransoms unless and this is the this is the however part, really. Uh, you've got to be mindful that if it is an organization that's linked to terrorism, then there is a criminal offense in relation to that. So uh, a word of caution on, on that front. What I would suggest if you if you do suffer ransomware, if you've got insurance and it doesn't necessarily have to be cyber insurance, it may be through your normal business insurance. Quite often, insurance companies will have ransomware negotiators that they can access and they will tell you a bit about who is. Uh, potentially, um, uh, you know, launching the ransom, uh, and they may even be able to negotiate on your your behalf. But in terms of protecting yourself against ransomware, backing up data is a really important thing to do. So if you do find your data encrypted, you may only lose maybe 24 hours worth of data, which is still a major inconvenience, but it's not like you've lost everything. So backing up data, whether that's as an individual or as a company, is really important. And my advice is, it's a business decision. It's a tricky one. Take advice from lawyers. Take advice uh, from from uh, from the board uh, before making a decision. But you know there is no guarantee if you pay it that you'll get your data back or all of your data back. And it may also tell the cyber criminals that you are someone who is willing to pay uh, ransoms and therefore might be a repeat victim. So it's a really really tricky decision. Okay. Thank you. And then um, sort of follow up on the password manager. Can about them being hacked. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, Inga's absolutely spot on. And in fact, one of the major password managers was recently hacked because the criminals quite rightly say, well, that's all where the valuable data is. So we'll go and target that. Yeah, they can be. They're not 100 um, percent secure like anything. Um, but, um, you know, I, I would still suggest they are a much better way uh, of securing your data than using simple passwords. So there is a risk, but the risk is very low. Okay. Um, and then further question, can we do cyber essential certification from somewhere so I can help my organization or what, what would be the best suggestion for that? Yeah, I mean, Hardy, if you want to, to contact me afterwards, um, I'd be delighted to help you with that, put you in touch with one of our partners to support you through the cyber essentials process. Um, but fantastic that you're interested in it. That's really great news. And it demonstrates to, to, your, uh, to your customers that you take cybersecurity seriously. So please contact me and we'll, we'll, um, we'll put you on the path to cyber essentials. Okay, thank you. Um, and you, yeah, you covered a lot, and it's obviously a changing world. Is there is there a sort of view on where the next threats are coming from, or is it all a big unknown out there? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the threat landscape, uh, you know, is constantly evolving. We were talking this week, early this week, about the threat from artificial intelligence. Um, you've seen in the last few weeks lots of debate about whether government should start regulating it. That's a really interesting concept at the moment because artificial intelligence we're probably all using now in part of our our working life. But criminals are also looking at it to see how they can commit um, more offences against businesses. So there's really interesting there, I think, in terms of the growth of artificial intelligence and, and what threat that poses. So uh, watch this space on that front. The other thing as well, I think, is a is a major threat for us are what we call you know the Internet of Things. So these days it's almost impossible to escape being able to buy a device that hasn't got some connectivity, whether it's a coffee machine, uh, you know, or an oven these days, they all come with some form of connectivity and potentially they all, all possess a, a vulnerability. There's a, a code of practice in the UK the government have produced around consumer devices. There's some legislation now around mandating three of the 12 principles that were in place there. So we're starting to see a little bit more government interact, uh, interaction now in relation to I, IoT devices. But, you know, I would always say to businesses here, just be mindful if you allow staff to bring their devices into work, you know, what do you allow them to plug those devices into? Do you allow them to plug them into desktops, et cetera? Um, you know, so be be mindful of that and think about the risks that you might see. Okay. 
And you're, you're clearly sparking everyone to think about what they need to be doing next, because the question that's just come in is what, what hardware software can we get to help protect EG firewalls, et cetera? Is there, is there any kind of recommended list or place to go for that kind of advice? No, and, and it's a good question. So, so as, a, as a starting point for 10, your operating system that you, you, you buy for a micro small business or even an individual, you'll find they pretty much come these days with standard antivirus or firewall uh, technology belt, built in. And actually, in most cases, that's pretty good if you're, if you're a sort of a small micro organization for anything more than that i'd suggest you need to go out and speak to a, a professional it services company um, they are uh, you know really um, uh, you know experts in their field to advise what's right for you and your organization but yeah it's one of the things i'd love to be able to say is that if you're this organization in this sector these are the things you need to have in place um, but one of the things i would always say most of that cyber crime is simple to to um, to prevent by just doing those really, really simple things. And most of those simple things don't cost a penny. You know, backing up your data, making sure your updates are, all, are automatically set. So you've got new software when it comes on board, making sure you've got robust password policy, those types of things, really simple to do. And that will put, put it go a long way in, in improving your cybersecurity. Thank you, Simon. I think we've probably all learned a lot from, from your presentation this morning. I um, I checked with you in advance and you said that you're happy for us to share the, the, the slides Absolutely. that you did. Um, and we will also be making the recording of this webinar available on our YouTube channel on our website. So that should be on later today. Um, and I will certainly be recommending to people that they watch it because I think there's, there's lots to be learned from it. Um, so thank thank you very much um, for, for joining. I will just use this opportunity to final reminder to our, our members and anyone else watching that it's our conference next week covering a whole host of um, topics on Tuesday um, and um, it, the programme and ticket information is available for that on our website and you're able to either join in person or, or online for that. Um, and we will be looking at future Workspace Wisdom webinars. If you've got suggestions for topics, please do get in touch with the, the Flexa team um, with any requests or suggestions. Um, and we'll be, be putting details, hopefully, of those onto our events page on our website shortly, along with other things um, happening. So finally, thanks again to Simon. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good rest of the day.